conversation right now talking about trout in the Great Lakes. To look at it in terms of, you know, good old Clint Eastwood, my, my real hero, you know, can kind of sort of see the, the good old days here. This is back in the uh, 80s and 90s, and this is really what you expect to see in a trout, is that as the trout got older, the lipid content would get richer and richer. And trout were basically, in those days, they were the old couch potato. That's what they were doing. They were hanging around, getting fat, reproducing, having a good time. But during the, um, the 90s, you can see something was happening. By the time the fish were reaching about six years old or so, they were leveling off, and they were no longer increasing in their lipid content. Something about the food web had changed, something's occurred in the Great Lakes that really is not helping these fish. And of course, we get into the ugly, and we can see basically where the slopes have, um, have changed dramatically. Um, basically, fish reach their maximum lipid content around about the four to five years old, and it's down to about 15%. And so, in Many of our trout we actually do see is that the lipid content has gone from around about 20% and to many fish down to about 5%. The system is really changing um, all around us. Well, you know, it's just not the trout. You know, the same type of data set can be generated for the uh, smelt for over the same time period. You see here from back in the mid-90s that uh, the, the levels of um, lipid and smelt have, have declined quite dramatically. And uh, other aspects that were going on with smelt at this time and with the, in the Great Lakes, this is some data from um, Rossman and Riley from 2009, looking basically at the forage fish populations of Lake Huron. And, you know, it doesn't take a statistician to realize they're collapsing and been, have been collapsing and continue to collapse up until today. But it isn't just the numbers that are going down. When you actually look at a data set like this, actually the condition of the fish is declining. So it isn't just a matter that we've put maybe more salmon in and they've eaten some of the fish. This is a matter of saying something has actually changed the condition of the fish. Again, we're seeing a very stressed food web. Um, and stressed food webs are very vulnerable to change. Another sort of um, means we're talking about do it using these environmental tracers is to look at bioenergetics and, and consumption. And really what we do need is have an in-situ marker of, of consumption. And actually, well, we do have one. Some of those very large PCBs, as I mentioned, really become superb measurements of bioenergetic. Because as I say, even for yourselves, I can know your total body burden. I know basically all the foods you consume to actually achieve your body weight today at your age because you can't really eliminate it at any particular appreciable rate. So the same thing occurs in fish, but even much better. And so we can actually see this uh, lifetime dietary um, exposure occurs through food, um, and basically the lifetime history of an individual's energy acquisition and assimilation of energy and growth are all being tied up in, in a PCB measurement. So it starts as a simple trend program, starts becoming much more than a simple trend program, become one of the most valuable monitoring programs in the world today. The, looking at the bioenergetics of individuals, we can see the, the trend is basically continuing through um, in the energetic density of trout. And this is some data from um, Mark Ryder, who's out in the um, audience here. And when he looks at his data set and looks in a bit more detail, what we start seeing is this huge amount of variability in the amount of, say, PCB 180 to the total energy within a, a fish. The fish are, no, are, are doing different things. And when populations get stressed, individuals start doing some strange things. We all recognize that. We see it in human populations as well. And so do fish. When they start running out of food, they'll start hunting around. Well, is this just happening in, in Lake Huron? No, not really. Um, what we'll do is move forward. And this is basically a little model using the stable isotope of carbon. And you basically use a mixing model to interpret where the fish has been feeding using stable isotopes. Back in 1992, using um, Rick Kirillich's data set, you could basically see, well, back in 92, trout were doing what trout should be doing. You know, wouldn't catch a trout in the nearshore zone. They were all hanging out there in the deep open waters of Lake Ontario, basically doing what trout should do. They're, that's what they're a pelagic cold water fish. That's their habitat. That's how they make their living. But look at 2008. Look where the trout are now and where their diets are. Their diets have changed dramatically. And they're tracking a new type of food web. Have things changed? Absolutely things have changed within the, the Great Lakes. 
And of course, this is affecting all our signatures in terms of how things are responding to nutrient control programs, contaminant programs, and other sorts of management programs such as habitat as well. So basically, the lake trout diet and bioenergetics have changed. Um, the lake trout is a fantastic indicator of contaminants. Um, it's also the effects of invasive species, um, and effects of climate change, eutrophication, and that's really what it's doing. It's giving us this integration of multiple stressors. And the more we use them, can learn to use this as an indicator, the more we're going to make wise decisions about the protection and conservation of the Great Lakes. And perhaps a, a, a suggestion uh, to, you know, for the, the report being developed, it really is a key indicator species. And perhaps it could be a good indicator species for the IJC to suggest to the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission, let's jointly work on this one fish as an indicator from managing fish stocks and from managing environmental quality in our system. Wouldn't that be a great way of promoting the ecosystem approach by having common indicators from different groups managing the Great Lakes in different manners? It can be done. And you've been watching live coverage of Great Lakes Week right here on Detroit Public Television and on our public television stations around the country and, of course, on greatlakesnow.org.